Welcome back to Small Caps. My name is Kerry Stevenson, and today we're bringing you a fantastic uranium story. And some of you may know it, some of you may not, but it is deep yellow. The ASX code is DYL. Joining me today is the Managing Director and CEO, John Borshoff. John's very well known in his uh, in the uranium space from his days with Paladin. Deep Yellow has been making some big strides in the space uh, with their project over in Namibia. John, great to see you. Welcome to Small Caps again. Great to be here and looking forward to our chat. John, before we dive into the details of today's announcement and also what else you're doing at Deep Yellow, for those that don't know, if you could give a brief overview of who are Deep Yellow. Right, Deep Yellow is an ASX listed company, as you mentioned. Um, I've been involved with it for, for four years now, and it is uh, a uranium company basically uh, uh, looking at some uh, properties it held in uh, before I joined in Namibia. And when I joined, we uh, started off with a two-pronged strategy, uh, developing and uh, our own existing assets in Namibia and also looking at uh, M&A opportunities for sector consolidation, which I believe the, uh, with the team I have will quite, are quite capable of doing. So on, uh, in the Namibian operations, we have uh, we've really advanced our TUMAS uh, project, which is a, a Langer Heinrich analogue, and, uh, and we've now almost increased the resource base by, f- by four. When I first spoke, we uh, just finished our PFS, embarking on the DFS. Yeah. And, uh, and, and from there, it's taken us to another level as this definitive feasibility study starts, starts moving. And uh, so we had, uh, we've had some upgrade drilling. Uh, the PFS had an 11-year mine life. We declared that this is a 20-year uh, operation and capable of it. So for the past six months, we've been drilling, uh, infill drilling to uh, upgrade the resource. That's been highly successful, and uh, and we made those announcements. To talk about uh, and and the other the other is uh, we've got an adjacent property with the joint venture with the Japanese, and uh, and we so we've got two projects on the go, and the country's working well for us. We're managing COVID and. Uh, yeah, and hiring people, uh, and which we'll talk about as well. Well, John, uh, you have been busy since we last spoke. I think it was back in February, and as you said, you're talking PFS to DFS. Um, Tumas is your flagship project over there in Namibia. Now that has had a significant upgrade, which you have made an announcement on. Has that put a big smile on your face? Because those numbers sound quite. Has it surprised you to the upside quite a bit? Because last time I did, you were yeah. a little bit sort of you were you were you were confident, but these numbers seem to be quite, quite <laughs> gone to the upside in a strong way. So we we always said that we would get more pounds into the system to get from our eleven and a half years to to twenty, and you know behind that there's a there's a three zero hanging around in terms of potential mine life oh. and. Um, and the but uh, to increase the grade, and uh, and and also to increase the uh, indicated resources by from what we anticipated was a double a double sort of banger if you like. Uh, normally, as you go from the lower category resources to the higher category, it's always the disappointment because as you drill more, it just gets less and less. Yeah. Or you know to the extent, but the consistency of the mineralisation uh, uh, and two minus three now is a standalone in the sense that uh, we we could be looking forward to the fifteen years of mine life just on that deposit alone. Wow. Never mind the three others that we have. So it's a it's a great uh, uh, position, and um, uh, these indicated resources we believe will convert to reserves. At a at a higher conversion rate than we had achieved in uh, in our PFS uh, for those resor- the reserves that we announced. So yes, it's been a, a great result, and uh, and in parallel with that, all of the other works that have happened, you know, with the environmental works, advancing the sort of test work on the on the on the DFS and uh, getting our, our mining our lease application ready, have all been sort of m- moving the project uh, along on the schedule that we anticipated. Maybe some things about you know, a couple of months late, but it's within the framework of what we uh, hope to achieve. 
And I think that's important because you are uh, literally ticking the boxes as you go along. But have you had any challenges along the way? And and if you can just explain to our investors out there who may not know Namibia as a jurisdiction, are they supportive of uranium? Because it is a little bit challenging in certain jurisdictions, but is what's Namibia like to work in an environment? Namibia, yes, so, so, yes, Namibia, uh, just to explain, it's a, it's a uh, uranium jurisdiction. Uh, it's got three uh, mining operations, um, uh, Rosting, uh, Huseb, owned by the Chinese, D- uh, Langer Heinrich, which uh, I started, but that's my fault. So it's very open to uranium uh, uh, sort of uh, production. And, and the country is, you know, diamonds and gold and all of that. So it's a, it's a good jurisdiction that, that uh, understands uh, mining and with the bureaucracies and, and such um, that are knowledgeable and, uh, and there's a good dialogue that always uh, happens there. Um, the challenges are that, um, well, COVID is, we, we have done very well with that, with that pandemic that's uh, sort of global uh, in the last six months. Uh, we've been have, operating with three, four rigs uh, drilled, you know, just under twenty thousand meters, and um, and 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 we've managed our our workforce with some, you know, very good discipline, uh, uh, sort of hygiene and protocols, and, and even having the, you know, the the bit of spare capacity when people are, are not available. So that's that's the sort of main challenge. Um, doing things by remote from here where a lot of the expertise lies and luckily we've got good expertise in Namibia um, and, and they are the real uh, aspect. But we haven't uh, really, um, you know, the government's highly supportive. They want development uh, without sacrifice of environment and, uh, and, and we, we're sort of tailor-made for, for delivery on that. Well, this, this announcement today uh, was a, a resource upgrade of some substance. Yes. Uh, and what sort of confidence does that give you? And what's the work, what, what's the news flow as you go along from this? Because clearly this is giving you a lot of confidence that yes. this is only yeah. just the start. And you're moving into a DFS. Just talk to us about what the news flow is. from. So the news flow is, is that now we've moved the drilling into um, uh, a deposit called uh, Tumas 1 East. Uh, which uh, uh, started immediately following the Tumas 3 uh, announcement. And we expect to uh, complete that uh, by about you know, 10th of uh, August. After that, we'll do a drilling update, which is just a drilling. And these are the results. And this is what, we, what we've got. Uh, it's, it's targeting about 20 million pounds of inferred uh, or 22 and, uh, and we hope to get a real big, decent lot of in- indicated out of that. By the end of next of this month or early next month, we'll, we'll announce the, the new mineral resources of that deposit plus the combination of Tumas 3 and Tumas 1 East, and then you'll see what this project is starting to look at as far as, you know, firmly underpinning the, the, the DFS requirements, and we'll probably... You know, 20, 23 years, and uh, and yet there's you know a significant amount more upside that we can then expand on that um, uh, in in later years. So we've got that those those announcements to make. We've got the um, uh, some announcements to make on our with our Japanese joint venture. Yeah. Uh, uh, in the in the September period in in. The, period of October, there'll probably be a reserve statement come out. And uh, so there's plenty of activity uh, on, on, the, uh, on the go. We'll, we've made our announcement uh, that the uh, mining lease has been submitted and, and accepted, okay. uh, which is a big position there. And that will then um, uh, is looking at being granted in, in part together with when we complete the DFS in the latter part of next year. Uh, just go. Let's just take a step back because uh, you talk about Tumas Three and then Tumas One East. Are yeah. they along the same sort of paleo? I'm trying to get a visual yeah. on this one for yeah. our listeners. Is right. that the so, same paleo channel? And yes. how deep is it? Yeah, so basically, uh, the, that that uh, that deposit 
between Tumas 3 and Tumas 1 East, there are two other deposits in between which have been drilled. And uh, so we've almost got a continuous, semi-continuous line of, of, of mineralisation ore bodies uh, that, that culminate to Tumas 3. And the, and the plant will be central to Tumas 3. Okay. So that, and that will have a, a, a big lifetime of which I mentioned 15 years will be just out of Tumas 3. Uh, we have other potential then to the west of, uh, of, of Tumas 3, and, and, uh, which is then another about 20 kilometres of, 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 of area where we know we've got resources, and they will also build into the picture beyond the scope of the DFS. Uh, it's a fabulous long-term uh, uh, deposit potential, and uh, what that allows us is to say, all right, you know, uh, instead of, you know, we want long life, but we can say instead of uh, producing three million pounds, we might go to three and a half million pounds staged up without sacrificing uh, the long life, which is so important in terms of customer and relationships and how we want to proceed uh, with them. So it gives us great optionality. Okay, so <clears throat> two mystery is obviously, is, can that be a standalone project? You mentioned the plant could yes. be very yes. close to two mystery. Talking about exploration, we can continue with the exploration. Would you, given that Tumas 3 has come out with such great results, would you start to put that into production as a standalone and continue the exploration? Yeah, no, and what will happen is, is that for, uh, uh, for the first 10, 15 years, all of the activity will be around Tumas 3. Okay. So that, and then as that gets mined out, it'll go to the adjoining deposits. So right. that's how we're looking at it. So in that in that way, and then of course, what is really great is that that Tumas Three Pit will become our our tailings repository, which is really adjacent there, and that's got enough space then to do to handle all of the uh, sort of twenty year mine life and plus. Well, as I say, I mean the numbers uh, from a from a man that has worked in this industry for quite some time. Just give us an idea of the economics around the numbers that have come out today. So the economics we we've said we've given the economics in the in the uh, uh, in our P, in our PFS and uh, and they were about twenty seven dollars sixty as their sort of uh, operating cash costs and about thirty dollars for the uh, uh, for the for the all up um, with 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 grade uh, with the size increasing. Uh, we, we can be looking at, you know, in the sort of mid-20s as a cash operating costs and uh, and probably in the high 20s in terms of the all-up costs and, uh, with, uh, you know, and realistic costs these are and they're not sort of... Uh, so, and that's, that you know, a couple of dollars a pound uh, over millions of pounds is a, is a huge amount of uh, profit in the bottom line, especially on top of that where we've got, you know, the grade... You know, even even at ten percent, fifteen percent increase in grade, is all bottom line, bottom line economics. You know, uh, and uh, because it's sort of, there's no further cost uh, essentially with with higher grade, you're just getting more winnings from the same amount of you know, effort, energy, reagents, etc. So, so with the with the uranium price where it is right now, this is still a profitable operation because we see no. The, no. Yeah. No. So what? What? Uh, what I, there's no profitable operation at these prices. Right. Um, the, uh, the you know Kazakhstan they 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 are just a little bit making, but it's generally agreed that you know the prices have to be uh, fifty five sixty five dollars to 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 recharge a sustainable uh, production uh, of, um, uh, of uranium. Uh, my my uh, philosophy is is that I'm not chasing down to get contracts. I'm confident in the market. I'm confident what the shortages are, and and we will not not push a button below sixty dollars a pound. Okay. Um, because I don't want to sacrifice. And I ha I say no kudos in, in sort of saying, oh, we're the first guys that produce, and you're creating this sort of legacy environment, mm -hmm. and then the price still increases above that. So patient. We're developing it. We, we understand the the, the the sort of market, and our our development um, uh, scenarios are post twenty twenty three because 
our DFS won't be finished till sort of the latter part of next year, and that's okay because I think the prices are still going to still going to be adjusting to where I believe they will be going, and uh, and so we're we're really looking in that. My my whole purpose is reward to the shareholder, and right. not being a, subs- a subsidising facility to supply cheap product to the utilities. John, before I go, because I, I do want to talk about your team because you are assembling a very strong team there, but given your um, knowledge in the in this space, what do you think will be the catalyst to drive that price a little bit higher? It seems to just be kind of like the gold price, just muddling along at the moment. Yeah, so the, the, the real, the real uh, issue is, and there's a lot of uh, people uh, sort of putting forces to bear uh, that can uh, sort of bring the price to react uh, uh, upwards. Um, I'm the, the real catalyst will be when the utilities put out for contracts for a period in the future, which might be 2024 to 2028, mm-hmm. and they get no responses. Okay. And and that's the uh, you know uh, oh, oh, oh hell moment you know to say well you know what is going on there is a shortage out here so that in itself will then I believe cause a a sort of a a stampede effect because once somebody once one utility can't get supply it it, it just pervades across the whole whole system and uh, and of course those prices are set two years before yeah, they're, they're met. So there's this sort of forward uh, uh, sort of awareness of where prices are, are going to be. And I think that 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 is the catalyst. Uh, it'll be a function of fear for sufficient supply. And, yeah. and coming into that then is um, to say, well, you know, who are going to be the, the, the builders? Where's the experience out there in the, in the, with all of the companies and who has produced? So apart from the Camacos and the and the um, uh, Kaz Adam Proms, um, now with uh, Rio unfortunately leaving the scene, so that huge expertise base is gone, and that leaves a huge vacuum. Uh, so you can expect that there'll be some exacerbation of shortage mm. filters to supply, uh, which are geopolitical, technical skill sets, all of those sort of things. Will have uh, and and you know your boards the, the people have got to believe say look these are a fact and we we will build them into the reward structure of how we work to our shareholders and, and, and also um, that ever growing fear of climate I mean we've got to we've got to make uh, people have to understand uranium is a very very clean energy for the future oh, uh, it's becoming more and more aware now in fact the the more pressure that's been put on the world for decarbonisation. Yep. the more it dwarfs the ability of renewables to meet that challenge. Yeah. Uh, it's so apparent. And, uh, and so the, the, the sort of intermittent uh, six hours a day uh, production, which is really important, and batteries might give you an extra hour, but, you know, if you want a clean baby, uh, a nuclear, <laughs> delivering 100% of the time on zero you know, emissions now proven to be less than uh, the uh, wind and uh, solar, at, at least equal, but not greater, and uh, and and delivering at twenty seven, you know, uh, seven twenty four, and being able to provide hydrogen if you want it, which is the new sort of portable energy, and industrial heat, and water, clean water yeah. with desalination. It's it's a it's a beautiful thing, and um, and so that that is why. Still not put into the demand is how nuclear is going to take up that slack. Yeah, because because it can't be fossil. If if fossil is out, and uh, as they're talking, um, gas is just you know it's fossil fuel, but you know only sort of 60, 80 percent of the emissions that coal has got. So even they, you know, you're 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 still playing with your numbers. So I see a future that is not yet uh, um, uh, figured in with the analyst to say, well, this is this is where uh, nuclear has to has to get to, and yep. those discussions are already on in you know in place. Well, John, coming back to your company, and you have got a very good view of the future, which I think is and such a deep understanding of this sector. 
You've recently brought on a chairman who's got enormous uh, background in this area, Chris Salisbury. Can you tell me a little bit about his appointment and uh, how that rounds out not only your board but the whole team as a whole and why the team is so important to you as a managing director and CEO? I hope you can see my smile when you ask that question. Uh, no, I can't. The, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, uh, getting uh, Peter Salisbury on, onto our team as the chairman of the board, is a is a tremendous uh, sort of uh, achievement, I believe, for the company. A guy of his calibre, I've known him since 2004, on and off. He's worked with the RA Ranger. He's worked in Rossing. He's, he's, he's relevant to, to the Iranian scene. And there's just not another uh, MD chairman combo in the world that sort of matches that and it's exactly what's needed in this uh, uh, reconstruction of the supply sector where development becomes an issue and all of those decisions. So Chris coming on has is, is, is such an important thing in terms of uh, getting our board uh, in, a, in, a, in a relevant space to be in balance with where the company is and, and as, I, as I sort of... Uh, Often say that you can liken it to a a a body that that the head and the body and the legs have got to be in balance. And if the head is the board, the body is the executive management, and uh, with all the muscles that his head has, and the legs are the technical people. Have have one of those aberrating against the other, you don't have a company. So we really need to balance the abilities, and then each each of those sort of parts of the corporation doing their job, you know, delivering, questioning and all of that. So that is part of the, 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 the alignment of the company and, uh, and we're also dealing with the body where uh, we've uh, hired a new uh, or a head of uh, M&A, business development, who used to work with me in, Pal- in, in, uh, in Paladin and we're bringing in technical people uh, for the engineers in the DFS uh, a new chief geologist. So it's it's these are all all part of the companies. You you need to put them in place before you need it. Yeah. To, you need it. You don't just sort of go out there clamouring uh, a day before you make a decision because you just haven't got an organisation at that stage. So we're carefully building the asset base, the 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 people and its relationship, the systems that the company needs to work as it gets more complicated. And uh, so we're, we're really on, a, on, on that path to be okay. able to absorb other companies when we acquire that our systems don't get sort of limiting and, and cause those problems. Okay. So, now, I, I, I think it's great and what, congratulations because I know how uh, that's pretty exciting. It's, I can now see the smile on your face. Um, John, very quickly before we run out of time, we've spoken about tumours. Talk to me a little bit about Barking Gecko, which is one of your other projects, and what you're doing with the Japanese joint venture. So oh, yes, so we've we've announced Barking Gecko before. We we made some uh, we made a discovery hole last year, uh, an all grade intersection. Uh, we followed up some drilling uh, um, uh, early in March. Uh, we had a new program approved. We all part all parties, Jog Meg, Toro Energy, and its through its subsidiary. We're all contributing to the to the new twelve month budget. Uh, we've just started the the first module, the first half uh, phase one of that drilling program, and uh, and the results are are, are coming in uh, favourable. Uh, we hope to get that announced shortly, and um, and we're very very enthusiastic about the the basement potential, which is the sort of Rossing, Husab, crystalline rock type Leskitic. Uh, deposits and uh, that also then um, we have really good deposits that we haven't tested yet uh, on our own properties 100% uh, because we've been concentrating on the on the on the blood on the sort of easier to find uh, paleo channel type deposits sure. so we see a lot of news flow coming out of these these uh, these efforts as well and uh, we're really pleased. Are they going to be working alongside the work that you're doing with the tumours deposit? How does that sort of all sit together? Well, yes. Yeah. So we're managing, we're operators. It's our people that are doing all that work. 
yep. and uh, and uh, and Toro and uh, and uh, Jog Mega funding funding into that. Okay. So and we've got the capacity to to drill out. You know, should be fortunate enough to now sort of have enough mineralisation to say, look, these are becoming manifesting into deposits and the drilling programs there, and we'll just carry that out in parallel with the activities and the development of the adjacent uh, tumors. Uh, uh, Palia Channel uh, uh, DFA. Uh, John, thank you so much for that. Um, I love to finish up my interviews with this. Uh, you've given us a really good overview of DPLO and where you're going, and I congratulate you on the all the progress that you've been making. But for the, our investor audience out there, give us three reasons why you think right now is a good time for them to sit up and take notice of Deep yellow and what you're doing and what the future might hold. So I can't go past starting that um, we have one of the best uh, teams in the uranium space, and uh, that's easily said. Many companies say it, but when you look at it against the, the, the uranium sort of history, we're the only ones from my team and pal that delivered operations, and uh, and that is an important that. Uh, that sort of uh, is being underpinned by what this team is delivering. And so people can be assured that what we're saying is, is, is conservative, it's, it's real, and we're building on, on something we know will uh, you know, go to a good chance it'll go to a viable deposit. I think with the other reason is that we've got our M&A strategies for consolidations, which will bring added wealth into the company. And that with decarbonisation, you know, uh, Paladin, with its team, with what it's achieved, the projects that are developing in, heart, in sympathy, I think, with where uranium price is going and when it'll get there, that uh, we're, we're, I think we're a winner. <laughs> it's all in the timing, isn't it, John? It certainly is. <laughs> John Borshoff, Managing Director and CEO of Deep Yellow. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for joining me on Small Caps today. Great talking to you again, Kerry. Cheerio.